Amen. Good morning, Discovery. How's everybody doing today? Now, I was told that 11 o'clock is crazy. So don't make Pastor Jason a liar this morning because he, he said that 11 o'clock, you all crazy. So, so how's everybody feeling this morning? How's Bakersfield? We, we are so excited to, uh, to be a part of, of Discovery Church and to be a part of this network and, and for what God is doing uh, as we're playing some musical chairs right now. And, and uh, we're so excited to be a part of this team. We have an amazing pastoral team, and, and, and everyone is so awesome. And, and uh, I, I was sharing earlier that, that this, this is not normal. What, what we have here at Discovery is not every church. And, and uh, we are part of the church, but, man, the culture, the life, the, the love that we have in serving together is so amazing. And we're honored and privileged, my wife Alicia and I, to be a part of Discovery Church. And we're so grateful for our lead pastors and be able to call them our pastors uh, Pastor Jason and Veronica, and can we show them some love this morning? We so appreciate them. Amen. Amen. That's Pastor Jason's favorite thing. Uh, so, but uh, we we are so glad, and I'm so happy to have my wife here, Pastor Alicia. She was uh, singing a worship this morning. Tomorrow, we are celebrating 25 years of marriage. 25 years. We. We have four beautiful kids. Our oldest son actually moved here and is going to be involved with worship at downtown. He moved here with Pastor Matt. And I told my wife we're going up on 25. And 25 is a big deal, guys. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of years. And I think we're going to make it. We, we've, we've stuck it out so far. And I asked her, I said, babe, 25 years, wherever you want to go. You want to go to Cabo? We're going to go to Cabo. You want to go to the Dominican Republic? We're going to go to the Dominican Republic. You want to go to Hawaii, Spain, Italy? Where do you want to go? And you know what she said to me? She said, I want to go to Bakersfield, California. <laughs> so I called Pastor Jason. I said, Pastor, I need help. My wife wants to come to Bakersfield for our 25th anniversary. He said, we're going to hook you guys up. They put us in a hotel. We've got the VIP treatment. It has been amazing, and we have enjoyed our trip so, so very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited, guys. I'm excited today to get into our Legend series, and, and today we're looking at the life of Ruth. And uh, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about these different legends in the Bible and, and looking at their journey. So we're going to start it with our theme scripture in chapter uh, 12 of the book of Hebrews this morning, and, and we're going to jump into to Ruth's life today. Therefore, and, and that word therefore, I know Pastor Jason has mentioned this in, in some of the previous weeks, but in case you weren't here, chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is like the hall of faith. It's all these amazing, legendary people that live these amazing lives of faith. And so he lists these people in chapter 11, and then in, starting in chapter 12, he says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So the writer in Hebrews is like, look, because we have these amazing testimonies, these, these amazing witnesses of the faith that, that have done it before us, and not only have they done it before us, but they're in the grandstands of heaven, and they're, they're cheering us on, and, and they're saying to us, you and I, that we can run our race. And so the, the writer's saying, because we have these witnesses, because they're cheering us on, because we have their lives to look back on, let us, you and I, run the race of endurance that God has set before us. And as I was studying this week and last week over this message, I began to think about each and every one of us have a race to run. We all have a course, and, and your race is not my race, and, and my race is not your race, but, but we all have a race to run. And sometimes we're fortunate enough that, that our, our paths go the same direction, but we all have choices in our lives and, and different races that we can run. Some of us are running the rat race, and some of us are, are running businesses, and, and some of us are running ministry races, and, and we're trying to find what God's will is for our lives. And it's important that we're not running the wrong race, but we're running the race that God set before us. And if you find yourself frustrated this morning, like you just can't get ahead, and you can't get a breakthrough, and, and, and you're just constantly repeating the same cycles, I, I, I want to ask you this question, is it possible that maybe you've been running the wrong race. And so we're going to look at this life of Ruth and, and her journey and the race that she ran, and maybe we can see some things that would parallel to us, the, some, some truths that we can extrapolate from Ruth's life that maybe we can, we can gain some wisdom this morning. And, and the first fill-in for, for you this morning, when we're looking at the different races to run, uh, there's this truth that I want us to really think about today, and that is when you're standing at a crossroads in your life, trust God and follow your heart. Trust God and follow your heart. 
And I, I want to stay here for just a minute and, and explain myself because following your heart isn't being led by your emotions. It's so important that we understand that. Matter of fact, that word heart is used in the Bible over 800 times. We, we see it in scriptures like uh, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. And that word is cardia in the Greek over 800 times. And it's not talking about the cardiovascular organ that pumps your blood. It's talking about your inner being, your core self, these things that you know to be true, these things that, that you know are fundamental in your life. And, and we all have this inner heart. We all have this thing in us that we, we know right from wrong. We know that maybe you feel like, man, I was created for something more than what I'm doing right now. Like, like I, I got trapped in a job that wasn't for me, and, and, and I, I know that I could do something more. I, I've been called to something greater, and we know that. And the reason I know we know that is because there are a lot of times in life, after we've made a decision, we look back on it because hindsight's always twenty twenty. And we go, man, I, I, I missed it. I, I made a mistake. Have you ever made a mistake? I, I know I have. And I look back and I go, I, I knew, I knew that wasn't the right choice, but I did it anyways and I paid for it. And so when we're looking at the, at the life of Ruth, I want us to make sure that we're following our heart and that we're making good choices. And this woman, Ruth, this amazing journey that she goes on in Ruth. There's four chapters in that book. Read it. It's an amazing story. It's a quick read, but I'm going to give you the synopsis of it. There's, there's this man named Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, and they lived in Judah, Bethlehem, and there was a massive famine, and so they had two sons. They had uh, Milan and Kilion, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, man, these are great names for my sons. So Feel free. I think Milan and Kilion means sick and dying, so it'll build a lot of character if, if you name your sons Milan or Kilion or Emelec. You know, we, we don't want to leave him out. But they move, because of this great famine, they move their family to Moab, a, a, a foreign land. And there the two sons, Milan and Kilion, marry two foreign women, Moabite women. And Milan marries Ruth, and Kilion marries Orpah. Now, for those of you that are having a girl... Now you have a strong girl name for your next child, Orpah. It's a wonderful name. It'll build a lot of character. I encourage you to use that. It'll be wonderful. No one else will have her name, so she'll be very unique. So Milan, Kilion, Ruth looks out somehow, and then Orpah. So that's how it goes sometimes in families when you have multiple kids. And so they marry these two women. And so now Naomi and Ruth and Orpah are there with their husbands, and something happens in this foreign land. Uh, Elimelech, Milan, and Kilion all die. Now, Naomi is left with her two daughter-in-laws, and they're all widows. Now, in this day and age, in this time, in this culture, to be a widow, you, you were completely dependent on your, on your sons, and if they were gone, you were dependent on extended family. So here, Naomi is in a foreign land. She has no family. She has no sons. She is destitute. And if you were a widow with no support system, you essentially became a beggar. You, you were awarded to the state, so to speak, and, and you, you had no rights. And not that we're making a, a judgment on, on that culture, that it's a different day and age, and that's a different message, but, but this is the reality of what they were facing. And so in this story, Naomi tells Ruth and Orpah, hey, go back to your families. Get new husbands. Start new lives. I don't have a future and a hope for you. I, there's nothing for you the way I'm going. I'm too old to have more kids. They would be too young for you to marry, even if I did. So go back home. And, and Ruth knows within her innermost heart, to follow her, she knows she's supposed to go with Naomi. And so that's the, the journey we're going to look at today and, and some of the things about that journey and what happens to Ruth's life. And so there's, there's some realities that I want us to understand when we follow our heart, when we do the things that maybe aren't easy or maybe aren't expected, what, what happens, some truths. And so let's look at some truths this morning in following our heart. Number one, the reality of running your race, following your heart is not always easy. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Ruth 1, 7, it says that, that Naomi with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And so Ruth, not having any promise of a husband because Naomi wasn't going to have any more kids, not knowing anyone in Judah was willing to leave her, her land, leave her people, and go with Naomi because she knew that was her calling. 
but it's not easy. And sometimes uh, the, the path that God calls us to won't be easy, and it's not logical sometimes. Now, I'm not for making irrational decisions, and we should use wisdom, and, and we know all of those things, but sometimes a step of faith at the beginning does not look logical. And God will ask us to step out of the boat when there's a storm. God will ask us to take a step of faith when the provision's not already there. And, and for Naomi and for Ruth, this is not a logical step for Ruth to take. But yet, Ruth still takes this step. And a lot of times in life, when, when God is calling you to run a different race than you've been running, you'll take steps, and there will be people that will come and tell you and make a very valid argument as to why you're making the wrong decisions. This is the enemy's greatest strength. We find it in, in the book of Genesis at the very book of beginnings when he meets Eve in the garden as a serpent. He deceives her, and he, he lies to her, but he makes a very logical argument as to why she can eat the tree of life. And so it's important that we understand that the differences between logic and faith. And sometimes they coincide, but sometimes that first step doesn't look logical. We have to be careful about that. But here's the promise. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he said, Broad is the road and the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate and the path that leads to everlasting life, that leads to abundant and rich and satisfying life. Jesus himself said, look, sometimes the easy path is the wide path, but it's not always the rewarding path. It's not always the one that's going to get you where you need to go. And then he said this in John 10, 10, he said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, that you might have a rich and prospering life. And so there's those promises that even though sometimes the path isn't easy, Jesus promises, hey, there's a reward on the other end. So it's not always easy, but it is always more rewarding. And the second thing that happens when we follow our heart is following our heart can be lonely. It can be difficult to follow our heart. It's not easy, but also sometimes following our heart can be lonely. When Ruth was there with her mother-in-law, Naomi, she was leaving to Judah, and, and she was trying to get her daughter-in-laws to go back to their homelands. And it says in, in Ruth 1.14, at this they wept aloud again. And then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah, she, she heard the logical argument. Her race was different, and she went back to her people. But Ruth clung to Naomi because she knew that was the, the position she was supposed to take. But here's the thing. These women were close, and, and sometimes there will be seasons in your life where you're following after the will of God that some people can't go on that journey with you. Some people can't run that race with you. Their, their path is a different path. And so it feels lonely sometimes when we're following the will of God. But here's the thing, is no matter how lonely you feel today, you may have come into worship this morning. You may be sitting around a sea of people today and lifting your hands and worshiping, but yet still feeling alone in this moment and in this setting. And no matter how alone you feel right now, I want you to know that you are not alone. God is with you this morning. God has not left you. He has not forsaken you. God is with you where you're at this morning. Jesus made these promises in, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And when he was ascending to heaven, he said, I am with you always, even until the end of the age or the end of time. And then in, in John 14, he said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I'm sending a comforter. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. I'm sending a, a helper to you so that you will not be alone. So we have the presence of God in us, no matter what our path is, no matter what the race is that we're running, God is with us. And not that we're meant to do life alone, man, Discovery Church, we're all about community and doing life together, and we serve, and we work, and we live together. That's the New Testament church, but there are seasons. There are seasons of faith. There are seasons where you're following your heart, where people just won't understand. There are seasons where your family's not going to understand. And you're going to have to take that step of faith, and it's going to feel lonely, but you need to remind yourself that you are not alone. The, the third truth, the third truth for following your heart is, is sometimes it's, easy, or it's not easy, sometimes it's, it's lonely, but sometimes following your heart is scary. It's scary. It's like stepping out of the boat in the, in the middle of the storm. It's, it's frightening. It's, uh, it's the unknown, right? The monsters are are not as big as the shadows. It's, it's the scariness of the unknown that we fall into. And, and I, I'm, just so you know, I have a crippling fear of heights. And I'm terrified of heights. I, like, I can get up to like the third rung of the ladder, and then I'm done. Like fourth rung of the ladder, like we have to call the fire department, they have to help me down. It's a whole scene. It embarrasses my wife. It's terrible. 
And I hate that I'm afraid of heights. I, I don't like it. Like, this is a little high for me. I'm just going to be honest with you right now. It's just a little too tall. I probably should come down. But I'm going to stay up here, so it's okay. So I, I wanted to overcome my fear. And so we used to live in Tennessee, and we went to this theme park called Opryland. It used to be a theme park. Now it's a mall. And I decided I'm going to ride a roller coaster and overcome this fear of heights. And so I picked this roller coaster called the Hangman. And the Hangman had a track overhead and nothing in the bottom. And so your feet just did this while you're on the roller coaster. And so I get in line. I'm pumping up. I'm ready to go. I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to overcome my fear of heights. I'm going to do it. And Pastor Alicia was like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I can do it. My brother-in-law is like chest bumping me. He's like, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. I'm like, yeah, we're going to do it. Man up. Come on. We're going to do it. And I get on the ride, and I get in the thing, and I sit on a little padded beam, and they, they bring the, 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 the arm things over, and I'm making sure they're locked in because I'm a big guy. I'm like, this got to lock in, lock in, I'm making sure it doesn't go anywhere. Is the seatbelt, then I'm making sure the seatbelt's latched in. I want to make sure I'm in there. And like the, the, the butterfly are coming up, and I'm like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I'm sitting there, I'm waiting, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden here is, and the floor goes, and goes away. And my feet are just doing this. And I grabbed onto the armrest, and I said, this is a mistake, this is a mistake, this is a mistake. <laughs> and all of a sudden, boom, we take off. And we're going. And the whole time, with my wife sitting next to me, I've got my face buried in here. The blood has drained from my body, and I'm going, I want my mommy. I want my mommy. Grown man, I want my mommy. Loops and whips around, and, and oh, it was horrible. It's the worst thing in the world. You should never ride roller coasters. And at the end, they take a picture, right? And I so wish I had it for you today. My brother-in-law bought it when we got off the ride. And so the picture snapped, and everyone in the picture is doing this. And their face is being stretched, and the wind is blowing, and my wife is doing this, and I'm doing this. And I'm still afraid of heights. So it was worthless. So, so the message today is God giving you wisdom for a reason. Don't go above the third rung of the ladder. You're dismissed. No, I'm just kidding. The reality is sometimes taking a step of faith is scary. Sometimes it doesn't make sense for us. Ruth, when she went with Naomi, she was a foreigner in, in Judah, and, and they didn't have anybody to take care of them, so she, she had to go and, and gather uh, wheat from the field. She had to go and, and glean from the field so that they could eat. And, and because she was a foreigner and because she was a widow, it put her in a very precarious position. She could be attacked. She, she could, she could be, bad things could happen to her, so she put herself in a bad position, but she was trusting God's plan for her life. And sometimes... God's plan, sometimes our race can be scary, but God will take care of us. And this is what it says in Ruth 2.22. Naomi said to, her, uh, to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women and who work for him. And him is talking about Boaz, and he'll come into the story in a minute. Uh, he's actually a relative of Naomi that they found out later on. Because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. And so even though she didn't know it at the time, she was just going and taking a step of faith. God had already made provision for her. And it was scary for her, but God goes before us, and he prepares the way. He makes the crooked paths straight. God keeps his hand upon us. He doesn't promise us that bad things won't happen, but he promises us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And so I want you to know that even though your race might be scary, God's going before you. God knows what, what's in store for you. And, and Paul said this to 2 Timothy in, in 2, 1, 7. He said, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a soundness of mind. Right? And so we have to recognize sometimes when we have that fear in our lives that, that there's a reason for that. And then we have to ask ourselves, is this, is this God giving me some wisdom here? Or is this, is this the enemy putting fear into my life? Because God didn't give us the spirit of fear. So if fear is keeping me from doing the things that God wants me to do, where is that coming from? And if it's coming from the enemy, then we need to step out in faith. Jesus said that to his disciples before he ascended to heaven. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then he made this amazing claim to them. He said, man, you guys are going to pick up serpents with your hands and they won't harm you. You're going to drink poison and not die. You're going to cast out demons. You're going to lay your hands on the sick and they're going to be made well and you're not going to get sick. He made these promises, of these scary things that, that the disciples had to go and do. But Jesus made these promises like, look, I'm going with you because I've called you to do it. That I'm going to take care of you. And so no matter what your race is today, if it's scary, I want you to know that God is taking care of you. 
So our, our race is not always easy. Sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes it's scary. And also following our heart often requires sacrifice. Sometimes our, following our heart requires sacrifice. It, it, may, it may cost us something. When, when, when Ruth was with Naomi and Naomi was saying, you know, go back to your people, start a new life. This is what Ruth said to her in, in Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. She was all in. She knew in her innermost being she was following her heart. She knew that she was supposed to follow Naomi even unto death. And when God puts something in you, and you know it's God's plan and purpose for your life, we have to have that all-in mentality of no matter what it takes, no matter what the cost, I am going to follow God. Sometimes, amen, sometimes we need an all-in mentality. Don't leave the room for doubt. There's no plan B in God's, in God's eyes. You're not living your plan B life right now. God doesn't make mistakes. God knows where you're at, and he's making a way for you. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, right? Peter said, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So there's these promises that even though sometimes there requires a sacrifice, after a season of sacrifice, God will restore you. You are not meant to live in sacrifice, but sometimes we go through these seasons. So there's this amazing story. There's all these truths about Ruth's life. And so here she is. She's this woman of faith, and, and she's, she's looking over us. And if Ruth could come to us today, and if Ruth could could shout to us today and, and she could speak some truths to us this morning. What, what are the things that Ruth would say to us as we're running our race? Knowing the things that happened to Ruth and knowing what took place and, and how God made a way for her and we're going to cover all that, what would Ruth say to us? I think number one, the first thing that Ruth would say to us is she would say, God doesn't make mistakes. You're here for a reason. You're here for a reason. There are people in this place this morning, I believe with all of my heart, that your plan was not to be here this morning, but yet you're here. And that's not by, by mistake. That's not by happenstance. God ordained it because God wanted to get a hold of you this morning. God does not make mistakes. You're here for a reason. Maybe your business is struggling and you've wondered where you went wrong, but I want to encourage you, God doesn't make mistakes. You're here for a reason. I want to encourage you, no matter what state you're in right now, what our circumstances you're facing, that you can trust God because he is still working on your behalf. For Ruth, nothing looked right. For Ruth, everything looked disaster. She had been married. Now she was a widow. She was in a foreign land. They had no future for a hope, and yet God kept making a way. You're here for a reason. In Ruth chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to, to your dead husbands and to me. And may the Lord grant each of you... Uh, of, of you will find rest in home of another husband. May the Lord grant that each of you will find the rest in the, in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. It is not a mistake. Ruth could have said, what? I married the wrong guy. Look at everything that's happened. Look how much disaster has befallen me. And she could have said to herself, this is the wrong race. I'm on the wrong path. I've made the wrong mistake. But she said, no, I know in my heart that I've made the right choice and I'm going to continue to run this race. Man, there's people here this morning, maybe you've been running a race and things didn't go your way. There was loss. There was sacrifice. There were mistakes made. And maybe you've stopped running. <laughs> maybe you've given up on some dreams, on some callings, on some hopes. I want you to know that, that God is still working on your behalf. That you may have given up, but God has not given up. And today is your day to put your running shoes back on. Today is the day that you make a decision. You know what, God? All that you have for me, 
I'm going to go all in. I'm going to run this race with endurance. God, I want what you have for me. 1 Peter 5.10, remember, he'll restore, he'll support, he'll strengthen you. And, and look what, what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. And we love the scripture, but it's so true in this moment. And we know that God causes everything. Can somebody say everything? God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So God didn't say just the good things. He didn't say just some things, but everything. He causes everything to work together. So even your disappointments, even your struggles, even your stumbles, even your hardships, God is using those things and he's putting the pieces together. He's working and causing those things for your good, for his glory. And this is a promise that we can stand on, that Ruth is shouting to us today. God doesn't make mistakes. You're here for a reason. All things are working together for good, for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And guess what? You and I, everyone in this room, we are all called according to his purpose. God made you for a reason. So that's you. That's me there. And that means that everything that's happening in our lives, God is working for our good. It may not look like it right now, but God is working it for our good. The second thing that Ruth would say to us is that God will give you opportunities, but you do the work in front of you. Man, and this is, this is message time right here. This is just the, the truth of it. There's, there's a saying that, that the secret's in the dirt, right? It's a farmer saying that in order to reap the harvest, you actually have to do the work first, right? In order to reap the harvest, the seed has to be planted. And so a lot of us in this day and age, we, we want the harvest, but we don't want the work, right? And so we, we pray things like, you know, God, if you just give me the lottery numbers, I'm going to tithe the Discovery Church, and, and I'll open up an orphanage, and, and I'll do some good. I mean, I'm going to buy that, that, that benzo, but I'm going to do some good too, God. And, and I, I'm going to get that dental work done, and, and God, if you just do it, I'll, I'll do some good stuff, and people get saved. And we try to make this logical argument to God, but we don't want to do any work. We just want God to show up. And, and I, I'd love it if God, like every time he wanted us to do something, he would just pre-send a check in the mail, right? Like he wants you to start a business. Hey, by the way, I sent a million dollars last week. It's in your mailbox. Start a business. But God doesn't work that way right? God, God calls us. He asks us to take a step of faith because the secret's in the dirt. We do the work that's in front of us, and then God blesses it, and God shows up, and that way he can receive the glory. So, amen. So this morning, like, if, if you're on this journey, and, and you're wondering what the will of God is for your life, or, or you're struggling with that, or you're not sure, I'm going to give you a, a surefire way to find the will of God. Find a way to serve. Do the work that's in front of you. If you see something that needs to be done, do it. If you're not serving at Discovery, get plugged in and serve because when you begin to do the work, God will begin to reveal his will and his purpose for your life. And it will not work the other way around. And that's why sometimes in some churches, we have Christians that have been sitting around for 30 and 40 years and they're still saying, I wish I knew the will of God for my life. But they've never done anything to find the will of God. But if we will do the work, if we'll put our hands to it, if we'll serve in some way, if we'll get involved in community, God will begin to speak to us and we will find our destiny and our purpose and the joy in serving God and we'll find that endurance to run our race. I encourage you this morning. Do the work. Do the work that's in front of you. Paul wrote these words in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And, and I love this. It's, it's, it's a scripture that we use that we as a promise scripture. It's like one of our, our favorite uh, scriptures that we quote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And it says, my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And we love that scripture. We quote it all the time. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. But what we don't do is we don't read the verses before that. Because Paul was talking to this church that was, that was giving him offerings long before he got there. So this, this Philippian church, the church in Philippi, they were finding out that Paul had these needs. So they were raising funds and they were sending him support. They were doing the work. And he said, because you've done the work, because you went out and before you saw it needed to be done, you started, you started working. There's this promise that comes with it that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. So that promise is for you and I. If we'll put our hands to it, if we'll say, God, I'm going to serve, God, I'm going to run, God, I'm going to do, then he will supply our needs. And third thing, if Ruth could speak to us, she'd say, you're here for a reason. Do the work in front of you. And she'd say, God can change your life in a moment. Trust 
the process. Trust the process. God can change your life in a moment, but we have to trust the process. Here's what happened to Ruth. This is so amazing. Ruth left her homeland, and she went with Naomi with no hope for a future, no promise, nothing, but she knew it's what God called her to do. And then she did the work that was in front of her. She went out to the field and she gleaned from the harvest. And, and just so you know, like how, how that would work for Boaz's field, the harvesters would come and they would harvest. And then he had female servants that would come behind them and they would gather the grain. And anything that was left over after that, like widows and beggars could come and get. And so Ruth came and she gathered that. She did the work. She humbled herself and she was gathering that grain. She was doing the process. And then God gave her favor with Boaz. And, and look what happens in Ruth chapter 4. This is so amazing. The Bible says that Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And she gave birth to a son and they named him Obed. Now, Ruth was married to Milan for 10 years, the Bible tells us. And they didn't have a son. So I don't know if Ruth was barren. We don't know. But we see here in, in Ruth chapter 4 that God moved on her and, and gave her a son and his, his name was Obed. But, but check this out. He was the father of Jesse and the grandfather of King David. So in this process, Ruth had no idea the grand scheme that God was working. She had no idea how great the reach would be of her life because she ran her race. And if we understand the lineage of King David, we understand that Jesus comes from that line. So Ruth, this foreign woman, who was widowed and destitute because she followed her heart and trusted God, was then grafted in, and not only is the great-great-grandmother of King David, but she's also in the line of Jesus Christ, born of Joseph and Mary. God's plan for you is greater than you could ever imagine. It's bigger than you can think. You're not here by mistake. Maybe you've been running the wrong race. Maybe you've given up on your run. Maybe you got tired along the way. Maybe you've been frustrated. Maybe you've felt uh, lonely. Maybe it hasn't been easy. Maybe you've su suffered some setbacks. But I want to encourage you this morning, if Ruth could speak to us today, if she could call out from heaven and say to us, she would say, run your race with endurance. She would cry out, go for it. Trust God in the process. He will make a way. He's going to do something greater in your life than you could ever imagine. Run your race. Run your race with endurance. Trust God in the process and let him do something amazing in you. There's this amazing bamboo. It's called uh, Genoa bamboo, I believe is how it's pronounced. And when you plant it and you water it for like three months, you see nothing. You plant the seed for the bamboo and you water it and you water it. Every day you water it, nothing. And then like after three months, like six inches of bamboo pop up. And you water and you water and you water, nothing, just six inches, just a little bit of progress. And then there's something called shooting season for bamboo. And when it gets to the shooting season, that particular bamboo grows three feet a day. Boom, just like that. Now, months before that process, there's the planting, there's the watering, there's the trusting, there's the working, because there's coming a shooting season. There's going to come an instantaneous growth. There's going to be something that happens miraculously where, boom, in one day, three feet of bamboo. And for four years, it doubles in size as it grows more shoots. And it continues to expand and grow until you have a harvest of bamboo. And we see this principle in the Bible time and time again where God takes us through a process and then there's an instantaneous shift. There's a suddenly season. There's something that, that transforms. Joseph comes out of the prison and becomes the second most powerful man in all of Egypt overnight. Ruth, a widow with, with no hope of a future, who's, who's gleaning the field and basically begging, is now uh, the, the, the wife to Boaz and the great-grandmother of King David. You may be working the process right now, and you're not seeing the progress, but your season is coming. That moment is coming where God's going to turn everything around because you stay faithful in the process, because you're running the race with endurance. I want to tell you there is a finish line coming, and the reward is greater than you could ever imagine. Run your race. Run your race. Galatians 6, 9 says this, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time 
we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know, two years ago, Pastor Alicia and I were pastoring a church in Oxnard, California. And Matt and Amanda moved down to Camarillo to start Discovery Church. And they were having Sunday night gatherings and we were having Sunday morning gatherings and we began to help each other out. And Alicia and I knew that God told us to merge, to take a step back from the senior pastor role and to support Matt and Amanda and to build Discovery Church. And people thought we were crazy. And we had been hurt. We, we had struggled in ministry. We, we, we didn't know really what the outcome would be but we thought, you know what, we're going to take a step back and we're going to be obedient. And people said to us, people that loved us, they said, this, this is insane. Why would you give up your, your income? Why would you give up your position? Why would you take those families and, and help build somebody else's church? And we knew that God was calling us to do something greater. You know what we didn't know? We didn't know that in two years, we would be the lead pastors of Camarillo Discovery Church. We didn't know that Matt and Amanda would be the lead pastors of Downtown Discovery. We didn't know that we would be part of this amazing family of believers that love God and want to want to love God and, and, and love each other and change the world. We didn't know that. But because we were faithful to trust the process, we were willing to run with endurance. We were willing to get our hands in the dirt and do the work without receiving the glory. There was something greater on the horizon that we did not see. I share that with you today so that you know wherever you're at this morning, God has something greater for you. Greater for you. Amen? Let's bow our heads this morning.